Now, Oscar, you were born in Las Vegas, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, raised in Hawaii. Correct. Um, what was your childhood like? Did you grow up watching a lot of television? Like, is that something, like, did your parents encourage that? Uh, I don't know that they encouraged it, more so like that was kind of their version of babysitting, you know, like they would kind of just like put you in front of the TV and, uh, and that was it. But I loved TV. I loved all kinds, cartoons, you know, sitcoms, everything. Uh, and I read pro professional wrestling as well. I was a huge professional wrestling fan. My uncle got us into it and uh, my parents are both born in Iran, so we love the Iron Sheik which uh, I don't know if anyone knows who that is. He's a villain, he's a villain, but he was a hero in our house, so. <laughs> so Iron Sheik was a villain, and, and what did your parents think of you being, watching professional wrestling? Were they cool with that? I mean, I think that they were so enamored by the Sheik's presence that they were fine with it, you know, so. <laughs> As think, one is. Uh, you know, you can't, I don't know if you've checked out his Twitter, but it's, he's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I was interested to find out that, um, you wrote, and you wrote uh, humor editorials in high school. Uh, how did you, is, was that your first taste of writing comedy and why'd you start doing that? Uh, I think it was, I don't remember why I started. I feel like I was assigned it. It was like in a, it was in yearbook or something and uh, somehow the school paper was like, why don't you just write editorials, you know, like whatever you want. Could be funny and, and you know, whatever. So yeah, that was my first taste of writing comedy. I like, you know, I blew the lid off of prom and stuff like that, you know, different, uh, different typical high school things. But I remember really loving uh, the way that it worked in terms of writing, where it was less immediate than performing or stand up or something like that, where like someone can read what you've written in their own space, in their own time, and sort of is like a time release thing, where then they would come up to you later and be like, hey, I really like that thing you wrote. I thought it was funny, you know, so I remember really liking that. Did you know in high school that you wanted to get involved in show business? Not really. I mean, I, uh, I always loved movies, always loved TV. Uh, I applied to USC, and I didn't know what I wanted to major in, so I just picked something that sounded cool. So I picked international relations, because I was like, I, I like traveling. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Uh, <laughs> you know, but uh, I went to, in Hawaii, you know, you don't have a lot of, my parents didn't have any money, so we couldn't really tour campuses. So a lot of schools will come there and do like seminars and stuff. So uh, I went to the USC seminar one weekend and I was flipping through a brochure and I saw the School of Cinema Television and I read about it and I was like, this is what I want to do, not international relations. So then I talked to um, the you know admittance people and they were like, it's very hard to get into, good luck. So, uh, yeah. Hard I, sell, hard sell. Yeah, they were like, don't get your hopes up, kid, like whatever. We had, I think it was two weeks until um, the deadline for the film school. So I just. Did they say that? Don't get your hopes up? No, but it was inferred. <laughs> the guy, I could tell. He was yeah. like, you know, looking past me already to like see what was for lunch, you know, on the <laughs> menu board. Um, you, sh you should yeah. get back in touch with him now. <laughs> I should find out who that was. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Um, I was also interested to find out that you interned at National Lampoon in college. Yes, absolutely. What, uh, I don't think a lot of people know that about you. No, I'm surprised you know that. That's amazing. Um, uh, yeah, I did some research for this. <laughs> Deep dive. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you remember anything about that experience? I remember uh, just loving the, the National Lampoon sort of moniker, you know, like that was sort of comedy gold for me. Uh, and they, I was unpaid intern, you know, uh, I was also in school, and they said that if you wanted to submit, they had this feature called Letters from the Editor, where the editors would write as if <laughs> they were readers, and they were like, if you want to submit some, you know, we might pick one, and I remember just every week just coming up before I went with just like a bunch of letters from the editor, submitting, submitting, and then I think finally I got one in, and that was like a big, big deal for me. Uh, did, did, um, did you, you know, a large part of your, so much of your story is, uh, you know, about being uh, a barrier breaker and so much of your, uh, you know, with Fresh Off the Boat and now this uh, With Always Be My Maybe. At that point in college when you're doing National Lampoon, you're just coming off, you know, are you surrounded, are you, are you, do you, do you feel the weight of being a woman of color at that point? Like, what, you know, are you, do you feel like you're writing humor at that point for, for essentially a white audience? Like, what were you thinking? Are you thinking in those terms at that point? You're not really thinking in those terms, but that is the audience that all those places were targeting, you know? So you're really thinking about 
how do I impress these people so they'll hire me, you know, to write for them? So, you know, for a long time, I think in comedy, like the gatekeepers were, you know, straight white dudes, really. So you had to kind of be a chameleon a little bit and kind of learn what they liked and what they didn't like until you got the chance to write for yourself or in your own voice. Or, you know, you would write in your own voice, but it would always kind of be under the, the Trojan horse style of like what they were doing, you know? And what did your parents think of you pursuing this career? Uh, I think that they didn't quite understand it, you know, as a career. Like, they obviously knew what writers were, but they f it felt like it was like novelists, you know? They weren't angry. They weren't angry, no. They were happy I was going to college, for sure. I mean, <laughs> that really, you know, that sold them. But, uh, <laughs> you know, they, uh, there was really no plan B for me because, you know, I, I, I went to undergraduate film school for four years, so it wasn't like I had something to fall back on. So it was sort of fingers crossed. Um, after you graduated college, you started with, um, I, th I think it was animation. That was your, kind of your first, you know, I think you did Pepper Ann. That's right. That was the first job I um, had. And, and for me, I was also shocked to find out, you, you, I think you wrote an episode of Recess. Which, That's right, yeah. Which for me was like, oh, well, this person's legit. I mean. <laughs> like, yes, Recess, of course. <laughs> of course. Um, how did uh, getting involved in animation uh, coming, right, coming right as your first start your career, how did that shape your future? For me, animation was like grad school in, in a lot of ways because, you know, I was pretty new out of college. Uh, it was my very first job, and I learned how television worked from the beginning to the end. So from being in all those, you know, development meetings to getting a writer's room together to production to editing, scoring, mixing, everything like that, it really taught me a lot, you know, we did 65 episodes, so... Uh, it, of it, Pepper Ann. Of Pepper Ann, yeah. yeah, exactly. And um, it just taught me how to kind of see things, you know, far in the future, sort of like three steps ahead kind of thing. Was working in animation fun? Like, w did you have fun doing that? Like, what was, what was your... So fun. It was so fun. fun. Yeah, it was so fun because you're not constrained by, oh, we don't have the money to, like, build this. So if you had a joke... And then somehow you could kind of go off a, on a little bit of a tangent. You know, if you had a joke about the moon, you could cut to the moon and <laughs> just, you know, right. uh, do it that way, which was fun. Uh, and then came Malcolm in the Middle. Malcolm in the Middle. Malcolm That's in the it. Middle, uh, which, which was a remarkable show, but it was a very white story, right? Definitely. Were you the only, or only person of color in the, in the writer's room? I believe that that is accurate, yeah. I don't think there was, I can't remember any other people of color And did there. you think about that while you were in the room? Did, you, did that ever weigh on you in any way? Well, again, you're sort of, you know, you're the lowest level on the totem pole, so the thing that you're trying to do is get a joke in, or you're trying to pitch a story that your boss is like, and you're trying to figure out what the tone of the show is and how you can write in that tone. Um, and so given that it. that experience that you're writing about is so much different than what you grew up with, right. was that a challenge for you? It was challenging, yeah, definitely. I think, but as a writer, you know, and I'm sure you have this too, it's like depending on who you're writing for, you can adjust your style, but it is more of like a, it's not something you feel on a visceral level, like the stuff I did later, even the stuff I did with Pepper Ann, um, you know, it's something that's more learned and more cerebral, I think, than from the heart. Mm -hmm. um, with Fresh Off the Boat, um, what drew you to, to that project? What was the, what was the uh, reason you were like, well, this should be a television show? Well, I had just done a show for ABC that got canceled called Don't Trust the Bitch in Apartment 23. And <laughs> that was a fun show, thank you. Um, and so I knew that uh, I was mourning the death of that. I didn't want to do something that was in that space, which is sort of about you know, women in New York, uh, kind of adult humor. So I was interested in the family sitcom as a genre, just because I hadn't done that, you know, my version of that. And then I read the memoir, Fresh Off the Boat memoir by Eddie Wong, and it was his whole life, I think up until the age of 30 or whenever. And there was a couple chapters in there about when his family moved to Orlando so his dad could open a Western-themed steakhouse. And in the 90s, and I was like, that's it. Like, that's the TV show. Like, you just take, <laughs> take that section. And um, I pitched it to 20th. I was like, this is what I think the show should be. And I related to it very much, you know, because 
you know, my parents were not born here either. So I really related to that kind of like first generation idea of kind of being that bridge between the outside world and the inside world, you know, like explaining stuff to your parents and then explaining stuff about your parents to your friends. Uh, you know, like when they would come over, I would explain to them what all our foods were and like the different sort of customs and, you know, why my grandmother, when she was praying, had to like cover up the mirrors and stuff like that. And then I would have to explain to my mom like why I needed the new Jordans, like the new Air Jordans. And she didn't understand. She was like, you have sneakers. I was like, no, but that's not, it's not sneakers. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like that specific thing where she was like, I don't understand this. Um, did you have to, did it take a lot of convincing? For, for the higher ups to sign, out, to sign on? Uh, not, no, the thing that took a little bit of convincing was they, they wanted to set it in present day. They were like, why do we need to keep this in the mid 90s? So that was the only thing I had to sort of justify to them. And what, and what, what reason did you give? Well, I, I told them that I, th I think that because of the idea that this family is moving to a, like a white suburb where they don't know anybody, they feel isolated, it would change it to me if you could just go online and kind of find like-minded people. It, it makes you feel less alone. And I think that, you know, I liked the idea that they had to exist it, where they were. You know, you had to make it work with like the kids in your school and the kids in your block. Otherwise, you know, it's a rough, uh, it's a rough go for you. So they, I sold it through that. Mm. What were your rules that you told yourself that the show would be and what it wouldn't be? Uh, well, I mean, for me, it was always about entertaining. You know, we had to, the fact that they greenlit our show was big for ABC at the time. You know, they're, they've talked a lot about how there hadn't been an Asian American family on network TV even 20 years since Margaret Cho had her show that got canceled in, I think, 94. Um, so we knew that we needed to connect with audiences on an entertain, entertainment level, you know, like on Modern Families level. But what was very important to me was that we center this family, you know, and tell these stories. Because we're not, again, the, the family sitcom has been around forever. But I thought that you could sort of be a little bit quietly revolutionary in the way you chose to tell those stories. So, for example, you know, you tell first day of school stories, but you haven't sort of told it through this lens, um, through this family's experience. So that, to me, was the thing that we always have to keep in the forefront of our minds is like, what is their experience here? Like, how do they, you know, see the world? How do, does the world see them? And a lot of it too also came from, from my experience with my own family of like explaining white culture to them a little bit. Like there was a thing where, uh, you know, <laughs> you have to explain NASCAR. Like you sound like, a, <laughs> you sound like a crazy person if you try to explain NASCAR to someone who doesn't <laughs> right. know what that is, right? Cause it's like, you got a bunch of cars going around in laps. It's like 500 laps sometimes. And, you know, you're, you, they stop to change tires and, they, you know, you're all praying for an accident because that's like when it gets, <laughs> that's where people get excited. And you're like, what? Like, that's a sport? It's like, yeah, well, that's it's, a sport. It's kind of funny to me that your parents, like, took to pro wrestling. They were fine with that. I mean, you know, <laughs> fake fighting in tights, that's fine. NASCAR, wait, what? NASCAR is what, yeah. uh, without the Iron Sheik, I don't know that they would have, uh, <laughs> that was their wedge into, right. that was their access point. Um, it's one thing to say, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna tell the story, we're gonna tell an authentic Asian story. It's another thing to actually do it. Um, in terms of assembling the writer's room, what were you looking for out of your writers? Uh, well, first, you know, I had to like their writing, so I had to like their sample, then when I, set meetings with them all. It was about um, their experiences growing up as a version, like what was their version of feeling like an outsider, you know, because this family is moving to this neighborhood that is foreign to them. And, you know, that's what I really wanted to hook into. It's like, how do you feel? And that can mean anything, you know, that could be based on your race, your religion, your sexual orientation, the fact that, you know, you grew up with no money. Like what, what was it that made you feel like you were on the outside looking in. And, and that, to me, was very important. Is there a story you can tell us about a writer who would particularly strike you with some sort of uh, outsider-y story? Uh, well, there was a writer, his name Sanjay Shah. Uh, he was Indian-American. His dad ran a Burger King in Sacramento. And the stories about that, you know, were incredible. I was like, stop talking, you're hired. You know, <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> um, was it given, given that at that point, writers' rooms were very white, uh, in many cases very male, was it difficult for you to find the writers? As in, did you have to expand the networks with which you were tapping into? 
it just is a matter of making sure that it's a priority to you. You know, the writers are out there. You just have to decide that that's what you want, you know, and, uh, you know, you, you make that a focus and you go and you find these people and not through any, you know, some of my best friends are, are white dudes, you know what I mean? Like, well, hey, no, no shame. You have a white friend. I have a couple of white friends, <laughs> yeah, okay. some of my best friends. Um, you know, and it's not about not thinking that they could do the job, it's about providing opportunities for other writers and making that a priority. Um, obviously, you know, Eddie very famously wasn't thrilled with the way that the show turned out. I don't want to rehash that, however, Looking back on it, because you're now transitioning out of the show, because uh, you have approximately a billion projects too that you're about to, to commence on. Looking back on it, is there anything in those early days that you wish you did differently? Honestly, no. Like I really, when we got our green light, we were a mid-season show, so we had 13 episodes that first season. And like I said, there was no data. Nobody knew if it was going to work. Nobody knew if anyone was going to watch. So in my mind, when I assembled that first writer's room, I said, like, we've got a chance to make, like, 13 jewels, you know, because I don't know if we're going to get to make more. So let's, if we have to stop at the end of this 13, let's make sure that it, that we left it all out on the dance floor. You know what I mean? Like, we didn't check our swing on anything. So I really felt good about the stories we were telling. And if we had ended, I would have felt good about it. But thankfully, you know, we kept on going because people were into it. They wanted to see it. Um, let's talk about the film. Um, the film is called Always Be My Maybe. Um, let's go to the beginning. How did you get involved with the project? Uh, well, you know, I obviously knew Randall from the show. He plays the dad. And Ali Wong was a part of that first writer's room that I assembled. Um, that was before Baby Cobra and everything like that. I, uh, you know, knew her stand-up. I seen bits of it on YouTube. And I remember calling her manager. I was like, hey, does Ali have any writing samples? They were like, sure, we'll send you a script. So she, they sent me a script, I was reading it, and then like page nine, it stops. And so I call the manager, I was like, hey, there's something wrong with the PDF, like there's only nine pages. And the manager was like, no, that's it. That's the only, that, so she wrote like a nine page script, I think like the day before, I don't know when she wrote it. I'm sure her manager was like, do you, you need a script? And she probably just like banged something out in Google Docs. Um, so anyway, I just thought that was really uh, funny, and I was like, I have to sit down with her. So hired her, and that's how Allie and I, we worked together for two years on the show. So that's when she was working on Baby Cobra at night, you know, after the writer's room broke. And um, so that hit, I knew both of them, and they were like, hey, will you come aboard as a consultant, help us with the story? And I said, absolutely. And then things just lined up. I was supposed to direct another movie that wound up not going, and my schedule was cleared, and they said, uh, how would you like to direct this? And I was like absolutely, you know, jumped at the chance. Um, I think you had directed at least a couple episodes of Fresh yeah. Off, but I think maybe two or three. Yeah, like. and a couple of um, Don't Trust the Bitch as well. Oh, right. Um, was there a big, was there a learning curve going from showrunner to feature? Um, there is sections of it that is a big learning curve, but honestly, there's a lot that translates between being a showrunner in television is very similar to being a feature film director because it's all about creating a like world building, you know, creating a tone, introducing people to characters, uh, you know, modulating jokes, performances, everything like that. So there was a lot that was a, a crossing over. What's the difference? Uh, if, if there is one. Uh, primarily the difference is the length, right? You have an hour and 40 minutes to introduce people, you know, get them invested and then make it satisfying, make them laugh. Whereas TV, it's, it's long form. You know, you, you've got, hopefully, knock on wood, the idea is like seven seasons. So that, the time was different. But, you know, and also, honestly, the rhythms of the scenes are different because network sitcom is a very specific structure, uh, whereas movies, things can breathe a little more. The, the scenes can live, you know, longer, shorter, in a, di in a different rhythm. Um, what was the day like on set? Uh, and, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, Allie and Randall wrote the film, and they're also star in it. And are there scenes where, you know, they stop and say, hey, that is not what we wrote, or that's not how we pictured this scene? Like, what was, what was that like? Well, I mean, I threatened to recast them quite a bit. <laughs> so <laughs> I was like, you guys don't want to do it? I got 10 people here that, Good. no, just kidding. I would never, mm, just joking. Uh, no, no, it was never like that because we all are friends first, you know, so it was like, imagine making 
something that you love and care about with your friends. So it was... I'd rather not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about your friends, but... Um, no, but it was, it was very collaborative. It was very generous. Like, those guys are extremely generous. There's no ego involved. They were willing to try everything. Uh, whatever they... If they wanted to try another take, we would always do another take. If I wanted to try another take, we would do another take. And, uh, you know, we just wanted to make sure we, we got it. We got it all. Was there any improv, or was it all... All you know, mapped out to a T. Uh, no, there was definitely improv. We we got it as scripted, where we were happy with it. What I like to do, and I've done on my TV shows that I did on this movie, is I do uh, alt sides. So I have alt pre-written alt jokes for the scenes. They're in the actors' trailers in the morning, so the actors know. Oh, we've got these alt areas. The production, the crew knows, um, and that I've found opens things up, so you're not, A, as a writer, you're not killing yourself to craft the perfect joke on the page, you know, the one joke, you're like, I hope this works, and conversely, you're not praying for improv to strike gold, because sometimes it doesn't, you know, so it allows you that kind of middle ground, and it also opens up things up for, like, people to play and contribute, and it's a good, uh, I, I like it. Um, as a director, when you're when you're doing a scene and there is improv involved, is that a little difficult because you're, you don't have control over everything that's happening? Well, I mean, you know, when possible, as much as possible, I like to cross shoot to ensure that we get it. You know, so it is not like if I have both cameras running and they're both on you and we Im improv this hilarious bit and I'm super funny, but it's not, I'm the, my back is to camera, so then I have to come around and try to recreate it. That's death that that never works because it's like oh it's not as funny as it was that first time that's the whole thing about improv is the spont you know the spontaneity of it so um you know to prepare for it uh we allowed ourselves you know the best chance of, of getting all that stuff the first time so that's particularly interesting to me about the film is the importance of food i mean you have one main character who is a restaurateur several plot points happen um you know, sometimes food is a source of conflict. Uh, sometimes food is used to, um, you know, show culture and, and show. Was that a deliberate choice? Is that something you you went out of your way to kind of hit home more? I think you know when Allie and Randall wrote in the script that she was a successful restaurateur. Like the thing that we really liked about that is it it provided uh, a way to be creative in this uh, sort of structured business world for Allie's character. But also, because the two characters have known each other since childhood, so much is wrapped up. Like, for me, food is very much about memories and about, you know, shared experiences. What do you mean by that? Well, it's like, you know, I think everybody can relate to whatever, something from your past, some dish that you had growing up that was your favorite, that maybe only, you know, an aunt of yours makes. Every time you go over there, there's something that's like, if you smell it or taste it, you're instantly transported back to a certain time in your life. Um, it can be nostalgic, uh, it can be comforting, and I think in terms of storytelling, that's an element that we're dealing with here in terms of the narrative structure. So um, I appreciated that for that point, you know. Um, also, another interesting thing that the film does, which is it, which is remarkable, is that Sasha is not the only bread is is not not only the breadwinner, but really in another league professionally from from the rest of the cast. And so it's uh, one movie that reminded me of is uh, Sweet Home Alabama. Um, and her personality is really bold and daring uh, compared to Marcus, who is this kind of straight, you know, afraid to take risks kind of guy. Did you approach the film with any thoughts about how you wanted to emphasize or de-emphasize these contrasts? I think for us it was very important that yes, they are two completely different people, but we wanted them to feel like people that you actually know, um, especially, well, honestly, both of them, because I think for Randall's character, you know, we've seen the sort of guy who still lives at home or whatever, and he's kind of like a clown almost, like he's like a, like a loser or whatever, but that's not the case. Like I, we all know people who live at home because they can't afford to move out, but they're successful. Like he's great at what he does. He's got a successful uh, music career but he's not ambitious in the way that she is. You know, he's satisfied with less than she's satisfied with. And that's, no one's right or wrong in that scenario. Does you Sasha know? see that as a flaw in your eyes? I think she does at a certain point in the movie. She doesn't understand, like, you're so talented, you're so good, don't you want more? And he's like, no, I'm, I'm satisfied. And that idea of being satisfied to somebody like Sasha, who is very ambitious, who wants to keep going and is driven by the way she grew up, it uh, doesn't quite compute for her, you know. Do you relate to Sasha? 
Uh, I do relate to Sasha. Yeah, definitely. Because, but that's why for the Sasha character, like we wanted, and you know, myself, Ali Wong, like we're both career women. We have had success in what we do. Um, it's okay to show more than one emotion at a time, right? Like you can be uh, driven and also vulnerable and you can be ambitious and insecure and not know what you want and know what you want, you know, in certain aspects of your life. So we tried to paint her with as many sort of levels as we could. Um, there's a pretty amazing cameo in the film. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, you're in for a treat. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Yeah. Um, how did how did uh, how did you get Keanu Reeves to be in the film? Well, I mean, we uh, you know we wrote wrote the part with him in mind as our dream. So he, he was you wrote the part with him in mind. Yes, sent it to his agent, and that's the thing where it's like you probably will probably never hear back. And then we heard back from his agent that he wanted to sit down and meet, that he read it and he liked it. So he sat down with Ali and myself and we talked through the role. He had a lot of funny ideas. He totally got the joke. Um, it's something that I was really impressed with was that I think when you get to like a certain star level, like I, I thought he would just read his part, but he read the whole movie. So he understood how his, his role affected the bigger story. Um, and I really appreciated that thoughtfulness, you know, because we could talk about it on kind of a bigger level, not just, you know, the whatever many pages he's in the, in the script for. What was, it, as a first-time feature filmmaker, what was it like to direct him? I, I assume you had, what, three shoot days with him, something like that? Uh, four days. Four days. So what was, it like, San Francisco with him. what was it like to, you know, for someone who hadn't done feature before, what was it like to work with him for those four days? Uh, well, first I came in with a lot of notes on John Wick. <laughs> I was like... <laughs> I was like, here's how I would do it. No, um, it you know, it was great. It was, he was, he's such a pro that he makes it easy for you. You know, he knows, he knows everything about lighting. He knows everything about cameras. Uh, he knows where the coverage is. You know, we had him for a limited amount of time. So I had an extra camera that day. Uh, I told him, feel free to improv, whatever you do, I'm going to get it. So don't wait till we turn around. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and it was, uh, it was delightful. He had jokes he wanted to try. I mentioned the alt sides. We had written some alt jokes for him and he came in, he was like, I, I read the alt jokes. Do you mind if we try a couple more alts that I have? I was like, sure, absolutely. So he had a couple pitches that actually made it into the movie. They were very funny. Um, but yeah, it was, it was delightful. Um, being a director, obviously, as, as you know, has for years been a, a, like many things, a notoriously white and a very male space. Now that's changing a little bit with Ava DuVernay and you know some of these names. Um, how do you think a film changes with a woman of color in the chair? You know, it's hard to say because like I never, I can only look at things through my eyes, right? Like I have no idea how a, a white dude would direct something. You know, like I, I, I don't know if they would pay attention to the same things I do, if they would choose the same shots I do if they'd be dialed into the performances in, the, in a way that I am, you know. Um, I just know what I bring, and I'm very grateful to have had this opportunity to show that, you know, all we, all we need is more chances, right? All you need is people to be like, yes, you know, let's open the door wider, let's let more people in. Um, you're first generation, uh, your parents immigrated from Iran, uh, you grew up in Hawaii, you must have stories of your own. Have you thought about putting your own life in, on screen in some way? I mean, you know, I definitely have put myself into everything that I've done, but I haven't done like a straight up me thing, uh, like my own the Nanachka story. the movie? Yeah. Nanachka the movie, yeah. 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 We'll be here next year talking about that. Yeah, right. uh, no, I have not done that. I think at some point maybe, you know, um, it's hard. It's hard to sort of figure out how you want to tell your own story. You know what I mean? Like. Or maybe other Iranian stories for an Iranian American. Oh, definitely, story. Yeah. definitely, yes, for sure. I would love to do that. Okay, so we are going to take a couple questions. Although I'm not clear, how, how are we doing the question? Oh, we have a microphone. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, I will call on you, and then uh, someone will hand you a microphone, and then we'll go from there. Why don't we go right here in the front row?
Thank you, Nanachka. I'm so looking forward to seeing the movie soon. And, uh, you know, I guess in the pre-Crazy Rich Asians world, uh, we were all uh, a certainly angry about having one-note stereotypes for Asian characters, Asian male characters especially. And so uh, it, it sounds like, I mean, it's kind of uncomfortably close. I mean, because uh, Randall's character is kind of this awkward guy, but I assume you break it up with uh, ways to make him relatable and uh, uh, sexy and interesting and attractive. So maybe uh, could you talk about how you thought about that and how you played that out in the film? Yeah, absolutely. I think Randall Park, to me, is one of the most talented actors. I mean, he's been in a lot of things, TVs, movies, TV shows and movies, but um, we haven't seen him as a leading man in the way that he is in this movie. He is all those things that you just said. Like, you know, he's in a band, so he raps in this movie, and he's so good. And people are like, Randall, do you want to, like, really start a band? Like, release a rap album? He's like, no, no. It's like, he's so talented that he could easily do that, you know? Um, so that was a big thing for us. We wanted to show that part of him. And also, he's sexy. Like, he is, he's a snack on the streets out here, you know? Like, he, in this movie, and we wanted to show it. You know, we didn't want to sort of, like, you know, have them hook up or whatever and then do that, you know, pan over to the curtains blowing or whatever, you know. I mean, <laughs> like, you know, we wanted to show it. And uh, we want to let him be sexy and let him sort of step into that role. And I'm excited for people to see him that way because I, I think that uh, a lot more opportunities are going to open up for him. All right, next question. Why don't we go right back there? Straight ahead. But Thank you so much for making this film in San Francisco, particularly. Uh, because both Ali and Randall are from here, let's say. How did you decide to use the location? How did you structure what your schedule would be? We have famously unpredictable weather, lighting, all those things. I also just, I'm glad you brought up the weather. Because we shot here last summer in July. And I, I wasn't ready, you know? Uh, <laughs> It, it was crazy. Um, I've never been colder. Uh, but no, I, you know, Allie is from the Bay Area, so it was very important to us to show San Francisco in a different way, you know, not just the sort of the postcard version, but for example, her, they, the childhood homes we shot in the Richmond district. And, you know, it's beautiful, it's real. That's where they would have lived. You know, uh, I was very excited to be able to do that here because I know it can be challenging. We shot the, in the farmer's market that's just right here, like two days a week, which was great. And we didn't have complete control of the crowd. We had some, but not all, uh, which I also love. So in the movie... Uh, did that stress you out as a filmmaker? Um, at first, I didn't know what to expect. I was like, are we going to be able to... Is everybody going to be looking at our cameras? Nobody cared about us. <laughs> they... <laughs> they were trying to get the best deal on radishes, you know? <laughs> and so in the movie, you'll see a take where Allie comes out to greet Randall and she's sort of jostled by these women who are not extras. Those are women <laughs> who were going for the cucumbers, you know? Like they, they didn't care, they didn't see Ali Wong, they didn't see the camera. Um, and I loved it, you know? It was really, really great. And there were moments like that all throughout uh, our experiences shooting here, so I, I really loved it. Um, sir. I'm sorry, I'm giving you such a workout. I apologize. <laughs> so in Fresh, you hear me? Cool. So in Fresh Off the Boat, why did you decide to make the characters Chinese instead of Taiwanese like they are in the book? I th uh, they're Taiwanese Chinese. And because I remember the episode where they talk about like ma making sure they remember their Chinese heritage. I didn't remember seeing that many episodes about like Taiwan. Well, we shot the premiere in Taiwan. The yeah, season completely wrong. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. No, we went to Taipei and shot the season three premiere out there uh, because Randall's brother uh, was getting married. So it was really important to us to be out there to shoot in you know all those amazing locations, the Grand Hotel. Um, yeah, I don't know if you guys saw that episode, but it was really fun. <laughs> uh, who has a question? It looks like we have one in the front row. I'm sorry to keep doing this to you. <laughs> we, we have a, a, yeah. the first ever pinch runner out of our QA. Feeling, <laughs> just feeling left out over there. How did you go about choosing the Richmond district to film it? Because that's my neighborhood. I was born there, raised there, I'm still there. <laughs> my mom says I'm probably going to die there. <laughs> you got to hold on to that real estate. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, what was your question? I missed it. 
<laughs> How did you choose the Richmond district oh. to film? Um, well, that's where Ali is from. You know, Ali grew up in that neighborhood. So um, there's a when you guys watch them, you haven't seen the movie, have you? No. So when you see the movie, uh, there's a I needed um, the side by side houses. So I was looking for a very specific street, and Ali sent me reference photos. She's like, "This is what I want it to be. I want it to be around." The Richmond area, so that's where we scouted, and we looked for a lot of different places. We uh, we ha we identified a few. A couple of people didn't want us to shoot in their houses. We got sometimes we got one side to say yes, one side said no. We needed both sides, <laughs> you know. So it was a little bit tricky, but then we found the perfect the perfect spot. So um, and we had to shoot there at Magic Hour. We wanted to get the light, as you know, with the weather. You never know. Is it going to be super foggy? Uh, and we got very lucky when we shot out there that night. So I'm excited for you to see it. What other little obstacles did you come across while shooting that you didn't anticipate? Uh, well, uh, the definitely, um, like I said, the weather was a was a thing that we didn't anticipate. Um, when we shot a scene that wound up being very shortened in the movie, so but initially, it's uh, Allie and Randall's characters as kids sitting on a bench. Uh, talking about what they want to do when they grow up. And it was completely foggy that night. And so they were, you know, looking out over the bridge and the, uh, the fog horn was going off like every 10 seconds. <laughs> so I couldn't get, I couldn't get a clean dialogue run. So our, like our sound guy was like, I'm going to kill myself. Like I can't, <laughs> I'm going to jump into the ocean. And I was like, okay, let's just, so we had to reset every 10 seconds. So, the, and these kids were pros. So it was like, they would get as far as they could, fog horn, we'd pause. And I'd be like, okay, keep going. It was, it was insane. And it was so wet, like our script pages were breaking apart, you know? And I was like, I think we got it, but yeah. Are you coming back to San Francisco ever again after this? <laughs> I mean, no one told me about July, but I'll come in, <laughs> I'll come later. I'll come in uh, October, or whenever it's sunny, yeah. Um, I think we have a question over here. Thank you. Um, I actually have two questions. The first one is, when you first started, after you graduated from college, was this your ultimate goal, to be a showrunner and a director, or did you just kind of take it next step, next step, next step? I definitely took it next step because, uh, you know, there's no way to know how it's going to... Like, for me, I think I was one of the few writers who never wanted to direct. It was never a thing for me. It was just I wanted to, you know, get paid to write, which is what I love to do. And then once you kind of feel comfortable at that level, you're like, okay, no one's going to kick me out of, you know, like the, I, I can make a living at this. Then you start to feel more comfortable writing in your own voice and telling the stories that you want to hear. And then you decide that the best way to get those stories, to get the words on the page onto the screen is to do it yourself mm. because you know exactly, or at least for me, I see it in my head. Mm. You know, so working with Ali and Randall, it's like going through the script with them. It's like I, I saw it in my head and... I knew exactly what they wanted to convey, and so, you know, it was definitely every step of the way kind of thing. That's really cool. Um, sorry, thank you. My second question is, I thought I heard um, that you're transitioning out of being a showrunner for Fresh Off the Boat, and what's your plans and why? Yes, <laughs> yes, so I started a new, well, I will start on June 1st, a new TV overall deal at Universal. So um, I'm excited about that. Fresh off the boat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and Fresh Off the Boat is produced by 20th. Uh, so when we got picked up for season six, um, you know, which I'm thrilled about. So that show is going to keep, but I'm leaving that studio. So I'm trying to get everybody up and running and put the people in place and then, you know, have them keep telling those stories. But at this point, we've done 101 episodes. Uh, which is crazy. Yes, thank you. Uh, so yeah, I'm excited. Um, why don't we go over here? I think you have a question. Um, oh. oh no, I found a dead zone. <laughs> <laughs> who? Hi. hi. Who are you reading now? Reading. Mm -hmm. uh, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who, you know, who's inspired you? What writers interest you? What books? Who are you reading? Oh, my gosh. Or well, where are you getting inspiration? It could be from other sources, too. Uh, I'm a big fan of theater, so I like to go see a lot of theater. Um, 
I'm reading a book right now called Who Put This Song On, uh, which is a young adult novel, uh, which is which I really appreciate. This 17-year-old girl who's struggling with depression sets uh, every chapter to a song. Um, so that is a very well-written, very internal but beautiful story. Um, I love, you know, I'm a big fan of TV. Luckily still, it's not like, you know, uh, Killing Eve, I just watched the finale of. Not gonna give anything away, but it's amazing. Um, I, you know, I watched the first four episodes, so I'm, you know, kind of almost at the halfway point. I think it's interesting. I mean, I saw, I knew the end of the pilot was coming, but I was interested the way that they told that story, you know, and I love those two actresses. Would you want to write a play? Is that something that you'd ever want to try? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would be really challenging to write a play, and I would What would be, be different than what, you know, writing a TV script? Or a feature film, like what would be the what would be like the challenge or different? Yeah. Well, I mean, it would be much more contained, you know, like uh, storytelling wise, and I think you can't cut to the moon. And you can't <laughs> cut to the moon. Uh, you can't do any of those kind of uh, those tricks to break it up. But I mean, the way theater has evolved, I, I think that there is a lot more room than you know. It doesn't have to be our town. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be like everybody on stage at once. It can be you know, a variety of different storytelling uh, options. But yeah, I think it would be cool to do that. Um, sir, the green green plaid, right there on the about fourth row back there. Growing up, you said you enjoyed watching television. What were some of the seminal things for you that you watched growing up that formed, uh, or you thought was just great storytelling that you enjoyed, or help form kind of where you took your career? Let's see, uh, you know, I mean, as a kid, I loved Laverne and Shirley. <laughs> I really did. I, you know, I, I was like, just imagining, I was like, I wanna work in a beer factory one day, you know, like, <laughs> it would be amazing to just be so free, <laughs> um, live with your roommate. Did you tell your parents that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, no, 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 <laughs> no. They barely let me stay up to watch that show. Um, uh, you know, as a kid, I loved that show. I really loved Moonlighting, I remember. The um, the banter, you know, was pretty amazing. Um, I liked, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any, like, I mean, those those were kind of my favorite. And then, of course, like all the, you know, the sitcoms of the, of the era, like Family Ties and things like that. Um, but Seinfeld, to me, blew my mind. I think as an adult, when you realize that like the storytelling doesn't have to be what it's always been, um, you know, you, they sort of broke the the medium a little bit with the way that they, you know, told stories in, in nonlinear fashion and tiny scenes. Um, but yeah, those are some of them. Um, right there in the middle, uh, striped shirt. Uh, who's? I'm sorry, to whom? Oh, sure, of course. Hi. Who's your favorite character in Seinfeld? <laughs> I mean, I gotta say Elaine, you know? Have you seen a lot of the Seinfeld episodes? Have you seen the one where they go to that wedding in India? <laughs> and they tell the story backwards. So it starts with the end credits and it starts with the tag and then you go all the way back and it ends with the cold open. That to me is one of, if anybody has, you know, a half hour to kill, watch that episode of Seinfeld and just, you know, if you're stoned, it will help. But you don't, you don't have to be, not you. <laughs> not you, not you. So I was like, hey, we're in San Francisco, hey. Not you, not you. <laughs> just, I mean, an adult. <laughs> well, 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 that took a turn. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, in the back over there. Um, as you embark on this next chapter with Universal, do you feel the weight of being one of the first women of color to break through like this, like this weight of paving the way, 
or are you just trying to do you? Like, what do you do? Like, I mean, I've heard Ava DuVernay and Mindy Kaling talk about this. Like, what is it like for you to be in that position? Um, I mean, for me, I feel excited. You know, I feel excited at the opportunity that I have. So, like, there can be more stories, you know, that I'm interested in telling that who knows if other people would open the door to that sort of thing, you know? So for me, I look at it as like a huge opportunity. I'm excited that people have entrusted me with enough, you know, goodwill or whatever. They, they believe in the things that I believe in, uh, that they want to see more of it. Because they know that I'm not going to give them kind of the typical fare that maybe they've gotten before in the past. You know, they want to be in business with me and with the other people that you mentioned because of what we bring, because of that specificity and that point of view. And the more we do it and the more we show that we can have success, movies like this, shows like Fresh, um, the more chances other people are gonna get, you know, because there's so many more stories to tell. Um, it's just a matter of, of getting that chance. Um, over here in the front. Um, I, in the midst of the WGA and ATA kerfuffle, uh, I've been encouraged to see writers really lifting each other up and trying to not sort of give anything back in terms of the inclusion s s strides, albeit small, we have made. Um, and I'm curious, on the other side of it, in the terms of given that you're sort of in front of media suits, what you wish you could never hear again <laughs> out of a development exec's mouth as it pertains to that side of things. As it pertains to the WGA? No, no, as it pertains to uh, inclusion and oh. storytelling. Um, um, I think for sure the question that I, I never, I hope that I never hear again is, do you think people will watch? You know, because of course I think that. Like, that's why I'm sitting here, you know what I mean? Like. <laughs> It's not like that question triggers in me, like, oh, you know what? You're right. <laughs> that was the one thing I didn't think of. I hope I never hear that question again, for sure. Has, have you gotten that a lot in, in your definitely, definitely. In pitch meetings and stuff? Yeah. I mean, you know, in the development process, like, you know, uh, different studios, different, you know, different executives, like, do you think people will? And, you know, I, I think they're genuinely asking, but, um, but I hope that's a question I never hear again. Um, I want to end on this question, um, which is, uh, you've already obviously done a lot of barrier breaking yourself um, as a woman of color with Fresh Off the Boat and now with Always Be My Maybe. What do you think is the next barrier that needs to be broken in Hollywood? I mean, I would think that y it's, it's also new, you know, that I think you just keep allowing people who haven't had the opportunity to tell their stories. And so I think that when things are a success, like I said, the more will come. So I think the total, and Allie and Randall and I have talked about this recently, um, the, when we get to a place where we're not like sort of counting on our one hand the amount of shows that are you know created by people of color or movies that are directed by people of color or starring people of color, that'll be true parody. You know, when, when a movie or a TV show can come out and fail and it doesn't mean the whole genre is, is a failure. You know what I mean? White movies fail all the time. So it's like when, when you can be allowed to try and not have it work and everything's okay, um, that's something that I think is, is gonna be a place where it's like, okay, we're, we're, now we're out here in a, in a meaningful, more equal way. And are the floodgates open now for that, or do you see your movie, Crazy Rich Asians, Fresh Off the Boat, are they still at this point in Hollywood still aberrations? I wouldn't say aberrations, but I would say that it's the beginnings. You know, it's the beginnings of people understanding, I mean, even, even going so far as like Black Panther, you know what I mean, Wonder Woman. I mean, shows or movies that... Captain Marvel. Captain Marvel, you know, even Mindy Kaling's movie coming out late night, like the more... Uh, in every genre, superhero, drama, comedy, that you can kind of change what people have thought, like the long-standing industry traditions or whatever, or beliefs, and show that uh, there are other things out here and other ways to go about these, telling these stories, I think, all the better. Well, Nashka, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you guys uh, for having me. It was such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Um, thank you.